This is Escort Rock. And we're here today to talk about what happened to the gold and the cash that was taken during a robbery. Now, in May of 1862, eight bushrangers are going to raid a coach which comes past here, finishes it up in that gully. Now, on board the coach is 2,719 ounces of gold and 7,400 pounds in notes. And it is the largest gold escort robbery or robbery in Australian history to this very day. Now, in the Frank Gardner story, we talk about the planning of the robbery and how the gold and the cash is carved up, or our theory behind it anyway. But today, we're going to talk about are we right in those assumptions and did any one of those bushrangers show that they actually did benefit from the escort robbery? Who were the bushrangers? Let's start with Dan Charters. Reason being, when he's captured, he will actually name all the bushrangers. So he makes our life a lot easier. Now, Dan Charters is a stockman before all this happens and doing okay too. Has quite a few head of cattle, helps his sister at Pinnacle Station, and has no real reason, we think, to get involved in robbery. But his story, when he goes to trial, says that he is forced to join the gang to act as a guide for Gilbert and Gardner and the gang to come here. And also help them find their way back to Wago. And that makes a lot of sense because Charters is not really the bushrangering type. He's a bit nervous, a bit uneasy because before the robbery, he actually is behind the rock here with the rest of them. And he says to Gardner, look, I'm feeling a bit nervy about this. I think I should go and check the horses. And Gardner has one look at him. He said, yeah, you're pretty nervy, off you go. And he does, and he goes over the top of that ridge line and stays with the horses. After the robbery, Charters will become a free man. Because he turns Queen's evidence, they actually never punish him for being part of the escort robbery. But you remember, he wasn't even here during the robbery. He's nearly, merely turned into an accessory. The other thing is that by 1880, he's bankrupt. So if he benefited at all, he must have blown it pretty damn quickly. But there's no evidence in history to say that Charters had any benef benefits from being part of the escort robbery. And the other thing about uh, Charters that people criticise him for is his evidence. It gets a bit sort of wobbly and contradicts himself a few times. But when you have a look at Charters overall, he's, he's nervous here at the Rock. You can imagine being in a courtroom in Sydney, way out of his depth. You know, that's a pretty intimidating place for the best of people. So if you're a bit nervy, it's really going to get you. And the other thing is that Charters lives in the district and he's turned Queen's evidence. Some of the people that he knows are actually here at the robbery or he knows their families. And if he's going to live the rest of his life in the district, he has to be very careful what he says. So it makes sense what Charter says, and by all accounts, he does not benefit from this robbery at all. Dan Charters leaves here to go and check those horses because he got all nervy. He said there were seven other bushrangers here. They were Frank Gardner, he's a mastermind and the boss of the gang. He's number one right hand man, John Gilbert, John Bauer and Alex Fordyce. They're both stockmen who work near his sister's station and three other men, Harry, Billy and a Charlie. And he doesn't know those men by any other name, he just knows them as Harry, Billy and Charlie. Never seen him before, he says. So, who's Alex Fordyce? Well, he's a stockman that works uh, not very far from Pinnacle Station, or actually works on O'Malley's place, and he also works at O'Malley Shanty, and we believe that is where some of this robbery was actually planned and masterminded. So Alex Fordyce, while working there, hears about this robbery, and the idea of getting rich pretty quickly, must sound appealing, and he decides to join the gang. But during the robbery, he actually doesn't stick his head up, because as the coach goes past and they start shooting, one of the troopers will say he sees only six men with comforters, which are like scarves around their face, stick their head up and fire upon the coach because Fordyce has sat there quietly doing nothing. Now, after the robbery, Gardner will go and check his revolver and it's stone mothersly cold. And he says to Fordyce, I'm going to cut your rations because you didn't shoot. And when Fordyce is caught, he is then found guilty of being part of the robbery. And because two troopers were wounded, it is capital offence and they sentence him to be hanged. But there's such an uproar and a petition in Sydney 
And the fact that he never discharged his revolver means that they'll commute his life to sentence to life in prison. And he serves most of that at Berham Jail. But when he's released in 1876, same time as Frank Garden and John Bauer, he actually takes up a job at a butcher shop at Berrimer. Doesn't go very far. And there's nothing in Alex Fordyce's life to suggest that he did benefit at all from the robbery. He doesn't do anything out of the ordinary. He doesn't buy anything. He doesn't, there's nothing there to say, you know, he had a pile of cash when he got out. So we're pretty sure that when Frank Gardner said he's gonna cut his rations, he did a good job of it. John Bauer is also a stockman who goes to a Mallee shanty, doesn't work there, but doesn't want to drink, and also hears about this uh, planned escort robbery and a way to get rich quick, and decides to join the gang. Now, Bauer will be caught after the robbery and also be sentenced to be hanged for shooting those troopers. Remember, it's a capital offence. But there's such an uproar in Sydney and such a petition that uh, they spare his life and commute his sentence to life in prison. Now, when he's released, along with Fordyce and Gardner, he moves out to La Caligio, where he helps finance the construction of the Catholic Church. He also buys, shortly afterwards, 154 acres at a place called Hilston. And so it indicates to us that Bauer may have been a beneficiary of some of the proceeds of the escort robbery, because he hasn't done too bad for a guy who just spent 12 years in jail. So Dan Charters names Gardner and Gilbert at the robbery. And he says that they were the masterminds, they planned this. Now we did a six part series on Frank Gardner and it talks about his whole life and he's a very dynamic character and it's worth just having a look at and getting a feel for what sort of man he really was. His two I see is John Gilbert, but another man in this story is John O'Malley. Now he is not named at this rock by Charters, but he does say there's a Charlie, a Billy and a Harry here. Now Harry will cover off on because Charters will identify him and Charlie, we're pretty sure we know who he is as well. So it's logical that Billy must have been John O'Malley. The reason he doesn't mention O'Malley is because Paddy O'Malley, who owns the shanty where this is all planned, or part of it was planned, is not a very, uh, what would you call, easy man to deal with, probably a pretty dangerous sort of a guy. And Charters knows this and decides not to name John O'Malley here at The Rock. But we're pretty sure O'Malley was here because when the gold is carved up, Harry, Billy and Charlie are the only three men to get away with gold. And how does Billy, which is now John O'Malley, lose his? Down at the Billabong. So Charters names Harry as being one of the men here at the Rock. Who's Harry? Well, turns out Harry is Henry Manns. Now, who was Henry Manns? Well, he was once a stockman who saved up his money and bought a bullock team and become a teamster. Now, sometime before this event, John Gilbert, John O'Malley and Frank Gardner will bail him up on the road just south of Forbes. And they're so impressed by uh, Manz's as demure, being, having, while he's having a revolver pointed in his face, they decide to recruit him into the gang. Why would they do that? It was done the day before because they needed some teams of bullocks up here to lay this site out. So the day before the robbery, Gilbert, Gardner says to Gilbert and, and Charters, of all people, I want you to go out and convince Henry Manns to join us in this robbery. And Henry Manns says, look, I'd love to help you out, but I don't have a horse. And Charters says, I'll loan you a horse. Now, why would he need to do that? Because Manns brings his bullock team up here, probably in the company of another teamster. They're the ones that make sure these bullocks don't get too flighty and stay here long enough for the robbery and the horse is to help Manns get away because he can't get away on one of these bullock teams. Manns will later be caught down near Quandary Station in company with Charlie, the other man here at the robbery, 
and John Gilbert. He's also here. And Henry Manns has 213 ounces of gold on him. There's divots in this rock that look different to what you'd expect from natural erosion. Like little balls in them. Yeah. Last man, Charlie. According to charters, there was a Harry, Billy and a Charlie. When the gold's carved up, Harry, Billy and Charlie were the only ones to get away with it. Gardner, Gilbert and Bow lose their gold to Sanderson. Now that is all covered in the, Gilbert, in the Frank Garden story. Then down at Tamora, near Tamora, a place called Quandary Station, a Harry Turner, Henry Manns, John Gilbert and a Charlie turns up again. Who's Charlie? After the escort robbery, Pottinger, who's in charge of the Forbes police station, will split the search team into two parties. One is taken by Sanderson. He heads to the east, gets to Wedden Mountains, and is lucky enough to pick up that 1,250 ounces in a pack horse. Good find for Sanderson. Pottinger goes to the west, gets out as, out as far as Hay, and then makes a beeline straight through to the east. What he's looking for is trails that are heading directly south with a group of horsemen. And he gets lucky. He finds a trail with three horsemen and he follows it for about a day. And at a place just south of here called Aria Park, he sees three horsemen that he thinks are very suspicious. He goes up to the first one and it's John Gilbert. Pottinger comes alongside of him and says to Gilbert, that's a fine looking horse you got there, young man. And Gilbert says, oh, thanks. Now, what's going through Gilbert's mind? Holy cow. I've got Pottinger or a policeman right next to me, a trooper. So Pottinger says, do you own that horse? And Gilbert must be thinking to himself, oh, I'm in deep trouble now. And he lifts himself, he says to him, oh yes, of course, lifts himself in the saddle, digs into his back pocket. But as he does, he digs those spurs in and he bolts, he takes off. Pottinger turns around and picks up the other two. And he questions them and they give their names as Charles D'Arcy and Harry Turner. He searches them and he finds there's 213 ounces and 135 pounds in Harry Turner's saddlebags. And the gold is actually in an escort bag. So it's getting towards the end of the day. He puts manacles on them and he takes them to Quandary Station. It's just north of Barrier Park. He holds them there overnight. The next morning, he loads the gold into his saddlebags. He puts the notes into a saddlebags of a pack horse and they head towards north. They're going to Forbes. Now they get to Mural Creek here where I'm standing and it's not far, very far from here that Pottinger and those troopers are challenged by four masked horsemen. What happened overnight is John Gilbert went all the way back to Wedden Mountains, got the assistance of Paddy O'Malley at his shanty and with Paddy O'Malley, Johnny, John O'Malley, Alex Fordyce and John Gilbert, they come back here to challenge Frederick Pottinger. Now, Pottinger sees what's going on and he takes the initiative, puts the spurs into his horse and takes off with the gold. So he keeps the evidence, but that pack horse takes off as well with 135 pounds in it. Pack horse is never recovered, but somebody got a pack horse and 135 pounds to add to it. Troopers Mitchell and Lyons will release Harry Turner and Charles D'Arcy. And Harry Turner thinks to himself, which is Henry Manns, I'm not hanging around these two any longer. I'm going to go to Murrumburra and get these manacles off and disappear. And that's what he does. He goes to Murrumburra. But he's unlucky because he will be arrested in Murrumburra shortly afterwards. Charles D'Arcy, John Gilbert and now John O'Malley are going to continue on to Victoria. But unfortunately for John O'Malley, he's not so lucky along the way. In John Bain's memoirs, he says that John O'Malley loses his gold at the Billabong. Now the story goes something like this. The three of them will head down to the Billabong and they walk into a public house. John O'Malley puts his saddlebags on the bar with the gold in it and his revolver on the bar and he says to everybody in the public house, he who takes the contents of one shall get the contents of the other. Now the night proceeds as you would expect and a lot of alcohol will be consumed and someone eyes those saddlebags off and thinks to himself, mm, I'll have them and grabs the saddlebags off the bar, they weigh 12 or 13 kilos and scattles out of the public house with O'Malley and another man in hot pursuit. 
and they've got their mount, they mount their horses, revolvers in hand, and they chase this young fella through the bush. Now, according to Vane's memoirs, this person will go on and buy a public house in Victoria, all of their own. Now, O'Malley is goalless, so he'll have to head back to Wedden Mountains to work in his father's shanty, and he'll go on and have a bush ranging career with Ben Hall. Now, how do we know all this happens? Well, Charles D.R.C. Gilbert in November of 1863 will put a letter in the paper protesting his innocence and the way he's been treated. Now, he says in the letter that he goes to the Lachlan Forbes to the diggings there in May of 1862, but he's not really happy with the, uh, the diggings. It's not that profitable. He doesn't really like it there and he decides to leave. But he's only there, he only arrives there a month before the robbery at Irungawa. He also catches up with his brother, who's a bush ranger, who's also the Lieutenant Frank Gardner, who's organising this robbery. He's also caught by Frederick Pottinger, and he admits in his letter, he was a, caught by Pottinger, along with Harry Turner, were now rescued by four horsemen. Now his only crime, he believes, is not handing himself in after being rescued. Well, they're probably right. But Charles Gilbert and John Gilbert come down here to the Coliban, which is a river right behind me, to stay with their father. My guess is that Charles Gilbert needs to get his manacles off as well. Now they're here for five or six weeks, and he says that after that, he and John Gilbert will go to New Zealand, to the gold diggings there. But John Gilbert's, and they must do that in late 1862, because by the time they get down here, stay five or six weeks, makes kind of a bit of sense. But then, John Gilbert's health starts to fail in New Zealand and he leaves. Now in his letter, Charles Gilbert says he doesn't come back to New South Wales. He can't remember where he went to, but it wasn't New South Wales. A few months after that, Charles Gilbert and his older brother, who's also in New Zealand, get arrested for being suspicion with, to being a part of Frank Gardner's gang and the escort robbery. They're sent down to Dunedin where they're processed. Fortunately for his older brother, he's got a few friends in high places who can testify that he definitely could not have been at the Lachlan diggings at that time, and he's free to go, but Charles Gilbert ain't so lucky. And he is sent to Sydney to um, go in front of a preliminary hearing and down to the police lockup where they try to get enough evidence on him, but they can't. And so he is set free where he comes back down here to Victoria, back to the coal band, back to where I'm standing, to write this letter of protest about his innocence. But you have to think about this. He turns up a month before the robbery. He's caught in company with Harry Turner, who has got gold in escort bags after the robbery with his brother, John Gilbert. He gets rescued. He doesn't hang himself in. He takes off back down to Victoria. Still with manacles on. You're much easier to turn up the police station and say, can you take these off? But he doesn't. So history doesn't implicate Charles Gilbert as part of this robbery. heading towards Victoria, Henry Manns comes to Murrumburra. Now the story goes, he gets caught at a place called Ryan Stables, which means he must have been closer to Bynalong than Murrumburra, because this is where the Ryans used to live, here at Bynalong. He it doesn't take very long, and the troopers come visiting, and they catch Henry Manns. They find gold under his bed, and off to Darlinghurst he goes to stand trial along with Fordyce and Bow. Now, in the first trial, the trooper at the robbery doesn't say in his evidence that he was wounded. And at the end of the day, the judge goes, whoa, says to the prosecutor, what happened? Were these guys wounded? And he said, ah, oh, yep. And he said, they didn't say so. And he goes, oh, we'll call him back. Because the judge says, there's not enough weight in this crime to send any of these men to the gallows unless one of those troopers are actually wounded. There was eight men there. So if they were shot at, you know, that's pretty hard to hang somebody. But if one of them were wounded, or two of them were wounded, that's good enough. So they say, bring the trooper back. But he's gone. He left Sydney and went back to Forbes. So the judge then says to the jury, okay, I'm going to retire you. Go away and deliberate. 
and tell us your findings. But before they can come back, he calls a mistrial. And so there's a second trial. They've got the whole process again, bring the trooper back and say, don't forget in your evidence to say you're wounded. Being shot through the testicles simply slipped his mind. Then in the second round of providing evidence, he says, oh yes, by the way, I was wounded. And that is enough to allow the judge to condemn these men to the gallows. But Bauer and Fordyce, as we know, will get a pardon and get committed to life, but not so for Henry Manns. They will hang Henry Manns, and it's such a botch that it horrifies the whole of Sydney. You see, in those days, they used to build a little platform out in front of the Darlinghurst Prison, where the main gate is now. They'd build a whole platform there, and they would hang them with like 8,000 people watching. And unfortunately, one of those 8,000 people was actually Henry Manns' mother. This hanging is such a botch and such a disgusting affair, it'd be one of the last public hangings in Sydney. John Gilbert arrives back here in Australia in January of 1863 or thereabouts, and it's not very long before he takes to the roads again in his bad old ways. He is very shortly joined by John O'Malley and then John Bain and then Mickey Burke, and the gang grows quite substantially, and he even eventually will include the notorious Ben Hall. Now, the gang goes on for a couple of years, but John Gilbert and John Dunn will be the last two surviving members of that gang. And by May of 1865, they have fled to Kelly's hut, running from the police, which is not very far from here at Bonalong, just the other side of town. And the police get wind that the fact they're there, and early one morning on the 13th of May, 1865, will raid John Kelly's hut, and they will, in the process of Gilbert and Dunn trying to get away, John Gilbert is shot and killed. His body will be brought up here to an unmarked grave at Policeman's Paddock, where we are now, well, by 1899, people have marked it as a place of respect. But here is this grave site of New South Wales' most notorious criminal, probably to this very day. was looking after those horses. Well, we think there was two other men here and that was Ben Hall and Johnny the Warrigal Walsh. Now, why do we think that? Is because Gardner was living very close to the Walshes when he was planning the robbery and he was having a liaisons with and Catherine Brown and N.E. Walsh, Johnny Walsh's sister. Ben Hall was also John Walsh's brother-in-law. He married his other sister, Bridget. Now, young Johnny Walsh was besotted by Frank Gardner. Frank Gardner had this really big, large and life attitude and very charismatic. And young John Walsh would follow him to the ends of the earth. And when he said he needed someone to look after the horses on the other side of that ridge line during the robbery, I bet you Johnny Walsh was so eager he couldn't help himself. But being such a young fellow at 16 years old, Ben Hall, being his brother-in-law as well, decided to come and keep an eye on him so he didn't get into trouble. So they were the men looking after those horses. Now, Johnny Walsh will be arrested, along with every other man in the district, while they're trying to find out who actually did the robbery, but they can't pin anything on young Walsh, and they let him out. A little while later, he's re-arrested on some trumped up charge, spends months and months and months in jail until he contracts a very, very dangerous fever. And just before he passes away, the authorities hand him over to the family and say, well, he's your yours. And he does pass away and he's buried at the Forbes Cemetery and he was 17 years of age. So young Johnny the Walsh didn't get any benefits of this at all. Ben Hall, he will always claim he was innocent, that he wasn't part of this robbery. In actual fact, the repercussions of him being arrested and harassed by the police will be the very thing that leads to him taking on bushrangering and becoming that legendary bushranger, Ben Hall. So if he had a few hundred ounces of gold and a few hundred pounds of notes, you would think he would have disappeared. <laughs> 
but he doesn't. Myths, legends, bush stories, tall tales. All the stuff revolves around the Escort robbery and the 2,719 ounces that we don't know what happened to it. Or do we? Well, 1,250 ounces was to disappear to Inspector Sanderson. He would recover it in three Escort bags in pack saddle, saddle bags on a pack horse. They were belonging to, we think, Frank Gardner, John Gilbert and John Bauer. And the reason we're confident with that story is that Frank Gardner would be interviewed later on and says that he did not benefit from the escort robbery very well. It was pretty much a failure. And he went on to Queensland where he had a reasonably successful life for about 18 months on the proceeds of previous crimes. So that makes perfect sense. The other three bags weighing about approximately another 1,250 ounces disappeared with Henry Manns. Now Henry Manns loses 213 ounces when he's captured by Pottinger, but what happened to the last 200 ounces? Myths and legends. Charles Gilbert, he's got another 400 ounces, we think. He does a circuit through Victoria, New Zealand, gets caught, comes back, publishes a letter in late 1863, and after that, is gone, disappears, cannot find this man. Did he take on a new identity, move to a new place with the proceeds of 400 ounces of gold? Again, myths and legends, but very possible. He also had an older sister, Eleanor, and she's living at Kilmore. And after John Gilbert's death in 1865, says they've come across a property of great value and she and her husband migrate to Ireland. So maybe they divided the gold up amongst the family. The last 400 ounces, it was lost by John O'Malley at the Billabong. Reportedly, someone builds a public house in Victoria. Now, it's interesting to note that when Frank Gardner gets to San Francisco, he actually buys his own saloon called the Twilight Saloon. He sends a postcard to this particular hotel on Swanston Street in Melbourne, stating he is the proprietor of the Twilight Saloon and sends it to them. Why would he do that? Maybe he's sending a note to them to remind them that he knows what happened to John O'Malley's gold in the last 400 ounces. But this is all stuff on myths and legends in the escort robbery. <laughs>